Uh, we'll soon be wrapping up the legal marketing portion of our camp, but before we do, we wanted to spotlight the topic of video marketing and what better way to do that than uh, a lawyer who has created countless videos for his firm. I think at the time we tried to count them and then you created more, so we didn't write the number down. Um, <laughs> but uh, he's seen video marketing be a driving force of growth in his practice. Um, Robert Govea, owner of the r, r Law Group, is here with me now. Robert, welcome to our Reboot Camp. It's great to be with you, Nick. I'm excited to talk about this. I love content creation, and I think that there's just a, a ton of opportunity, so I'm excited to dig into it. So am I, Joe. Thank you for the compliment, Joe Bravo. Uh, I'm not really a warrior. I find this stuff really energizing. Uh, yeah, Joe, I will sleep well tonight. Uh, I, was, I was stressed out about doing this, but while I'm doing it, if you can tell, I'm pretty up and at them right now. Um, so before I get into the specifics of how lawyers can accomplish their video marketing goals, um, can you tell our audience just how valuable like a, any video can be for growing their law practice? Yeah. So this is one of my most favorite questions because I think that it is honestly the most valuable thing that I do. And I know for lawyers, that can kind of be a shocking thing. It's like, wait a minute, you went to law school and you, you know, paid all this money for all of these classes and credits, and then you got your law degree, and now you pass the bar, and you've got this law firm and all this stuff. But for me, the content creation and the creating of the videos is the best way for me to create value for our clients and for our prospective clients. And it's one of the best tools that we have at our firm to actually accomplish our goals. And there's a number of different ways you can use video, but I've explored a, you know, a multitude of different methodologies and I've tried and failed many, many times. But when I figured out that the formula was about providing value first, the compound effects of this process, you know, you can create a video and you can say that is the final product. You put a video on YouTube, but the process of creating that video and the skill set you develop throughout that course, it, it forces you to get clear with your thinking. It forces you to become a better communicator. It really does help crystallize how you provide value rather than doing 30 second videos. And I did a lot of those where you're promising good outcomes and, you know, nice case results and things like that. If you, if you really do provide value to the audience and you continue this practice, it turns into this compounding asset. And that, that is something that will give you leverage in your practice, in your reputation for years, right? You can put one video on YouTube and it will continue to gather views for years. It's sort of an evergreen piece of content. And through this process, through this sort of self-exploration, this journey, you know, you, it, it has forced me, speaking from my own experience, to get a lot more capable in, in the things that I'm providing, the messages, really the value that I'm delivering to the people that we work with. And that has allowed me to sort of scale up our law firm and to, it, it enables us to really accomplish more than I would be able to do if I didn't have that tool. So when I think about, you know, growing a practice without video, and I'm not, I'm not even just talking about using video on YouTube. I mean, we use videos for training. We use videos for testimonial. We use videos in our firm. I send weekly for or uh, biweekly firm update videos to the team. And we sort of are, we use it as a tool to conduct our business. And so I think that, you know, especially moving forward into the future, that this is going to be a key tool. One of the, one of the most critical components that lawyers are going to have, and which is why I'm so passionate about it. I, 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 I'm shocked that, uh, because I've done that here for years, right. Is, uh, we have internal training videos for, uh, I don't know if I've ever spoken about this publicly, but we have internal training videos for all of the receptionists that answer the phones yeah. and, uh, I'm sort of embarrassed to admit that I created those videos and I did like a voiceover and it's not me. Like I'm not in the video. Uh, it's, a uh, that used to be really popular, like the animated things. And I narrate it and we talk about all the stuff and, uh, and I watch them and they're evergreen. I created these things like six or seven years ago and we still use the same ones today because I mean, the training was pretty good. Right. And we want right. to continue to onboard people, but it's, it's funny that you bring that up. Uh, I, well, and just, and just to pause on that, you know, think about how much time you have bought back for yourself, right. And your organization and your firm. And so, right. Even if there's lawyers out there who say, I'm never going to put anything on YouTube you know, video can still buy you back a ton of time. And if, even if you send this to people just as an explanation of how the consultation is going to work or after the consultation, these are the next steps, right? It's a video. Rather than a conversation, you can really, really claw back a lot of that time that is sort of fleeting. And that is also a compounding asset. You build out all these framework, all the scaffolding of all these different components. 
And then you fast forward six months and you realize you don't have to have as many of those same conversations anymore. Uh, I, I haven't thought of it that way, but uh, I had definitely saved other members of this organization a bunch of time with that. And I yes. want to let them know that. <laughs> you should, yes. No. Uh, we had you on our podcast, like in its infancy, right? I was just talking about this. And I think that you shocked a lot of people when you shared how many videos that your firm actually creates. And at the time it was 50 to 60 videos per month. So can you tell our audience about um, your practice's video creation process currently um, and how you ended up being able to pr produce that many videos? And if it's more, uh, I'm, my jaw is probably gonna hit the, the floor, but we'll see. So, so it, it is, it ebbs and flows. And let me, let me lay out how I was doing it back then and then sort of, uh, because the strategy has shifted a little bit. So when I was early in my law career, when I was just getting started on YouTube, what I wanted to do was try this approach where there was going to be a lot, sort of a lot of content. Okay. Right. Every video that you sort of create and put on YouTube, the way that I like to describe it is sort of like you're weaving another uh, hole in the net, right. And, and you create a big, big net out there and you're providing a ton of value in every one of these videos. And every single video is just a bigger net, right? Because you're getting impressions. Those people will click your videos. They'll watch. Hopefully you're delivering massive value and they decide that they need your help. They call your firm, they convert into a client, right? So if you want to grow a law firm, the, the idea is you cast a really big net and you assemble that. And so back in, I think that was in 2000 and gosh, I can't even remember when that was so much has happened, but I think 2018, 2019, what I was doing then is I, I was really being aggressive with crafting that net. And so what I would do is I would create a high, a high volume video series and sort of batch them together. And practically the way that this would work is it was sort of rudimentary back then. I had a, a you know, just a Logitech web camera, no real microphone, no real technology, I got a bunch of these whiteboards that I would just sort of hold on the camera, just like sort of sit like this and hold the whiteboard. And what I would do is type a bunch of notes into sort of a, a, a note, a document or whatever, send it to my legal assistant or, or to my assistant at the time. And then she would, she would hand write all of the bullet point notes on the whiteboard, right? Cause I can't write legibly. I tried it and the, 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 the people said, you can't, I can't read what you wrote there. So she would write it on there. And it would be just the bullet points, you know, DUI, first offense, DUI, penalties, okay, 10 days, nine days suspended, 2,500 fine, whatever, right? And I would just go through these pretty rapidly. I would come in on a Saturday or a Sunday, pick up one whiteboard, pull it up, go through the video, drop it down, pick up another whiteboard, do another video and drop it down. And I would literally do like 10 or 12 of those on a weekend, on a Saturday or a Sunday when I was sort of bootstrapping the whole thing. And I've got pictures of all the whiteboards sort of splayed out all over the office, you know, and it's kind of one of those things where I was just really aggressive with it in sort of this big wave of productivity. And I got a ton of stuff done, you know, in maybe six months or a year. And I did that up until about 450 videos or so, right? I mean, really like a lot. And then, you know, those are, I would say six to eight minutes long of videos. And so, you know, it's, 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 it's a lot of time that like, I'm not saying there's not a lot of work that goes into this. But I would pass all of that back off to my assistant. She would edit it. She would upload it. She would do the thumbnails. And uh, I would, you know, sort of monitor that process. And we, we rapid fired out a ton of videos. And those videos are still on YouTube and they're still gathering views. And this was many, many years ago, right? People still call our office and they say, hey, I watched this video. You know, can you help us? The answer is yes. So every one of those is, is part of that big net. Now, what I've been doing now is I'm basically re redoing I created a separate channel for our law firm because my channel has sort of matured into this sort of this uh, topical channel where I cover a lot of the news and I get a lot more uh, you know, people live on live streams and the strategy has changed a little bit, but now I'm sort of recreating that uh, a whole new law firm channel, which I'm actively building right now with the best principles in mind. I'm going deeper now rather than doing, let's say three, five minute videos on a DUI, I'm going to do one 30 minute video on a DUI, which is really just more in depth, right? More substance, more value, more answers to their questions. So I'm, I, so you know, the strategy has changed a little bit. And to be honest, YouTube has changed a little bit in, in these last five years, right? There are a lot more content creators on there and the quality of the production is getting a little bit better. And I've gotten a lot better. I can articulate my thoughts more clearly. I have better tools to use. My camera gear is better. And so now I'm going to try to uh, you know, to ramp that up. Now, to answer your question, I know I'm, I'm going long-winded here, but I also, uh, like, my, my pace today is is 
a lot faster as well. So last week, for example, I was getting out five pieces of content uh, every day. And this was a lot more substantive pieces of content. So I have about a 30 minute video that I like to get out before 8 a.m. Then uh, last week, four days of the week, I've got, I got two sort of R&R mm -hmm. law group videos completed. I got a short completed. I got a members only video completed. And then I did a live stream, right? And that's sort of when all of my gears are, are working and I'm not distracted with law firm duties, you know, because I can't hit that type of pace every day yet because I, a, a big part of, part of my day is still law firm business, right? Law firm duties. I'm meeting with my directors and meeting with all of the gears that need to be working there. But that's sort of how this goes. And, you know, right now, a lot of the underlying work, I, I have uh, delegated some of the content, uh, some of the thumbnail creation and some of the editing and those mechanics to, to team members. And I'm really trying to hone in on me just being that content creator where I can just sort of dump stuff out into the camera and then it just goes live. But it, it's been a long journey to get there, you know, and this is something that requires a lot of ebbs and flows and that content creation schedule is not going to be for everybody, right? So that, that is not ideal for everybody. Some people may want slower pace or, or less volume or whatever, but it does depend on your goals and what you're really trying to accomplish. So we were just talking to Andy Stickle um, and, uh, and Andy said something that, that struck me um, because it's really true. And, and we talk about this a lot in marketing is like 92 or really 98% of people aren't going to do this, right? Anybody who comes to your, your law firm website, 98% of those people fall off or, or, or don't buy anything, right? And like, a, I think even on Google, the number one result in the ads gets a, what, 4% click-through rate. Um, so only 4% of people that, that see your ad that you're paying money for, that you've worked so hard to get your reputation up there and your reviews and all of that, only 4% of people are going to do it. So 96% of people won't click on your ad. Um, and I, I, I say this truthfully because I mean this, 96% of people aren't going to listen to like a thing that you're saying and create video. Um, right. And I, I want to talk about excuses because I, I want to I get away from that 96%. I want lawyers to start really doing for themselves, right? Uh, improving their practice, making sure that they're getting more leads, making more money. I, I want the practice of law to become like this profitable thing that, that people can give back to their community and do the things that they went to law school and they set out to do for their community and also have time to like take care of themselves, not quit the practice of law because it's so overwhelming, right? So right. what are some of the most common excuses that you hear from attorneys as to why they aren't creating videos for their firm? And what are your responses um, in kind to those excuses as to why they aren't valid? I think you hit the first one on the head is time. A lot of people will talk about time. And, I, and I've worked with a number of lawyers that that's kind of the hard starting point. Um, for me, let me give you an example of something. So we already talked about the concept of buying back your time with some of this video content creation. When, when our practice was very young, one of the most popular legal videos that I ever made was about Arizona photo radar tickets. And when we were young, you know, people get these camera tickets, they flash, they go off, they get something in the mail, there's three points on your license, it's kind of a problem. So they call us and it's millions of dollars of revenue in Arizona comes from these things. So people call us and we were getting so many of these phone calls and I was having to field these calls, right? And it's basically the same story. It's the same process every single time. What I did is I made a 30 minute video and I post, posted it on the internet and I had my legal assistant or, or the intake assistant at the time just send those emails out to people. If they still wanted to call, then they would uh, call us back. If they still wanted you know, to hire us, basically after watching this video, they would do that. And so that process, right? Just that one video, yes, it took a little bit of startup energy and momentum to create that video, but that's been viewed, I don't know, 30,000 times, right? If you multiply that times 30,000 times 30 minutes, how many hours of time of value has our firm given to people without me having to do a thing, right? And that's just on one video on one conversation that I was having. So you can start to buy back your time. And really, I think when you start to see how much maybe uh, effort you're, you're expending on other marketing efforts that are low return on investment, right? Whether those are uh, networking events or, you know, these, these, these business organizations, I've done it all. Okay. So like, I'm not talking down about any of these things. I've done the, the business networking associations. I've gone to all, you know, these meetings, but a lot of those for us, in my experience, have just been low producing because we're a criminal defense law firm and we need criminal referrals. And those types of people are not kind of the target audience of those organizations. 
And so, you know, you start measuring those things. You start putting a couple videos on YouTube, you get a couple clients and you're going to see, you're going to make time for it, right? You're going to start to see some ROI and you're going to notice that it is a better ROI than go sitting around in a, in a big lunch in for two hours and, you know, sort of pretending like you're doing something useful. That's how I felt, right? I'm not trying to belittle anybody else out there, but big excuse. I think that, that, that if it becomes important enough, you can carve out a little bit of time, just a little bit, or you can skim off the top, right? Skim off of what you're already doing. If you're going to do a consult, just do the consult afterwards, make a, make a 15 or 30 minute video about what you talked about. So you just skim off that time, which is a big one. Now I know it's hard. I know lawyers are busy. I know, you know, there are parents and there are law firm owners and lawyers. And now you're telling people to be a content creator. I know it's a lot, but what I'm saying is that I think if you start to do it, if you, if you, if you, front loaded a little bit, kind of bootstrap the process, you'll see that, it, that it, it's a much higher ROI on your time. And you're going to buy back a bunch of time and you're going to save yourself all of the time expense of, of low ROI activities. Other people will say they're not a good fit for being on camera, right? That's another huge excuse. Uh, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not good behind the camera. I don't know what to talk about. You know, these are all, I think, these are all just sort of self-inflicted, self-limiting beliefs, sort of roadblocks that we put in front of ourselves. Uh, you know, I think the last time we spoke about this, I, I, I said my first video is still up there and it's grainy and it is me, like my lapel microphone. The camera is like literally out of focus. My lapel microphone, it's like, I got this earpiece in, it looked like this, like the cord was like hanging out of, you know, of the, of my actual shirt and everything. I mean, it just looked goofy, but I have matured or I, I've gotten more comfortable because I keep pushing those boundaries. And I think that that is a very rewarding part of this experience. And so I would just encourage people to sort of not, not limit yourself, you know, not impose those self-limiting beliefs. There are lawyers and there are, there's a content creator for everybody on YouTube. I mean, it really is diverse and there's no, you know, you don't have to look or sound like anybody else. You can be like auth authenticity. They say is the currency of the internet. Be your authentic self. And, and I know that sounds cliche, but it literally works. And then the last big objection often is a technical and process overwhelm. You know, what camera do I get? What type of videos do I make? You know, uh, how do I upload this stuff? How do I edit this? And all of that is very easily solvable. In fact, I learned most of how to do all of that on YouTube itself because there's a ton of content about that. But I have, you know, I have now synthesize the system for me that I think really works. And it becomes a lot more easy to identify what content to talk about with a couple easy frameworks. And then that really takes a lot of the, the heavy lifting out of the process so that you can just sort of sit down, create your content, and then delegate a lot of that out. Uh, I, I'm reminded of, I'm a big uh, like example oriented person. And uh, I recently, Actually, it's, it's really not recent anymore. He's about to be three. Uh, I got a dog. Um, I have never had a dog because I used to live in an apartment uh, where I was not allowed to have a dog. I've had cats. I'm, I'm perfectly fine with caring for an animal. Um, but my wife and I, we got a dog. We adopted a dog, rescue dog. He's great, right? Very cute. Uh, as soon as we get him home, he immediately pees all over my, my wood floor. Um, he's barking at my wife. He's running around in circles. He's trying to torture my cats. Uh, he's trying to go through the window at squirrels. He's just uh, like an unmanageable, just whirling dervish of energy. And, uh, and I'm freaking out, right? I'm calling my friends and I'm like, I don't know what to do about this dog. Like, what do I do? I, I hate this dog. I, I, I don't, I, I can't stand it. I want to smack him. I want to like, but I can't, like, I'm not going to hit a dog. That's terrible. Well, what do I do? And, uh, and my friends were like, dude, you can't get the feeling of loving a dog before you do the thing, right? right? So everybody will put these excuses in front of the, the thing. And, and, and really what it is, is I had to train my dog. I had to take him outside. I had to love my dog. I had to like, I had to learn how to do the thing, right? Because a lot of it is just like, I didn't know what I was doing. So right. the excuses are, well, I don't have the camera. Okay, well, why don't you Google what's the best YouTube video camera? I actually did that and I got that camera. It was like yeah. 60 bucks on Amazon. Uh, what's the best microphone? Uh, you can, if you Google that, there will be ads targeted at you to get a microphone. Um, how do I upload to YouTube? I'm pretty sure YouTube itself will teach you in its like creator studio how to upload a video because it wants you to upload videos. It, the, the, the platform is hungry for content. 
it, it's like, feed me. Uh, it, yep. it will help you to do it. Um, so what, what I'm telling you is, is that you can't get the results of this law firm marketing video content creation before you do the thing, right? So all of these excuses are just, they're, they're what Robert is talking about. They're just self-inflicted like barriers that we tell ourselves as to why we can't do it, why we can't have success. And the truth is everybody deserves success. You just have to do the legwork and you have to do the thing in order to get the result. You can't get the feeling of loving a dog um, before you take the dog outside and teach it to pee outside. You can't like have a catch with a dog before you teach the dog right. uh, that like you throw the ball, it goes against the ball. And then when you bring it back, drop the ball, right? Uh, it's just all of those things that we inflict on ourselves. But for anyone tuning in a little late, welcome to our law firm summer reboot camp. My name is Nick Worker. Today, we're focused on legal marketing. Here with me is Robert Govea, owner of the r, &R Law Group. And I want to say that there's so, so many videos out on the internet that I think another excuse that, that lawyers have is that I'm going to create this video, I'm going to upload it, and no one's going to see it. Um, so I want to help combat that by asking you, how, what are your top tips for getting videos or, or making videos that will actually get seen? Great question. And there's there's two different strategies. You know, I think it's really important before you answer a question like this to sort of articulate what you're trying to accomplish, right? So that we're making sure that we're setting expectations. And when I think about this, there's, I'm actually living this. There's sort of two different approaches that I take. So I've got my sort of a high view channel, right? Where I, where I want a lot of subscribers and a lot of views and a lot of activity. And that's where I talk a lot about some of the topical stuff, which I think maybe we'll talk about later. But th those are getting high views, right? And so if you want to do that, then that is going to be something where you're talking about trending topics, you know, you want really clicky thumbnails, right? These are these are practical tips, so that people are watching this trending content, the algorithm is recommending this, right? A good example of this would be sort of like what we saw with Amber Heard and Johnny Depp on YouTube. This for lawyers was like, uh, you know, a bonanza. It was, in, it was amazing. I saw one lawyer's channel go from her name is legal bites and she's her channel ballooned from like 50,000 subscribers to like over 200,000, right? Wow. Really, really high views because she was focused on a really trending topic and she did a great job and she was live streaming it. She worked her butt off, but it was, it was really capturing a lot of views, right? Grew a, tra a channel. Like I've never seen shocked, right? I'm like a little, little bit jealous, uh, uh, but, but like she did a great job. It was really cool. And it was that that's that's great. That's her strategy. Now, for most lawyers, that's probably not what you're really interested in. You're probably, you know, th that's cool. And she can make a she's going to make a living off that. That's just her full time job. That's what she wants to do. But there's another strategy. And this is sort of what I was talking about previously with you when I was explaining, you know, 450 videos, casting that big net that requires a different approach. And this is where niching down is really the most valuable way to handle this. So for example, I'm a criminal defense attorney in Arizona. If I said, if I made a video and I put it on YouTube, how to beat a DUI, okay, right? How to beat a DUI. I titled that. That was the subject. I went in there and I gave him, you know, a couple bullet points about how to beat a DUI. That video is going to be lost in the shuffle. There's going to be, there's a million of those, right? There's a lot of lawyers all saying how to beat a DUI and, you know, or whatever, pick, pick a, a, a topic, right? A general broad topic you're not going to get any views on those because why should anybody listen to you? Are you a nationally recognized criminal defense constitutional lawyer who's the authority with a million subscribers who can answer that question? Probably not. But what I would do then, right, if you go and look at our channel in the early days is flip that around and say, okay, rather than how to beat a DUI, really specific, how to beat a first offense DUI in the Phoenix City Court, right? Detailed, niche that down. Because there are people in Arizona who are looking for Phoenix City Court, they're looking for DUI help, and they're looking for what to do when it's a first offense. Okay, so you're getting very specific on those. Now, the downside to this is you're not going to get many views, right? Like this is not going to go viral, because a lot of people, are, you know, there's not that many people who got a first offense DUI in the Phoenix City Court. Honestly, there's probably, you know, a couple hundred a month, maybe. And that means that it's, it's a very niche target. So you're going to get, let's say, five, 10 views on that. Let's say you get 100 views on that over the course of three or four years. People on, you know, lawyers will take a look at this and they'll say, I'm doing a terrible job. This is horrible. Nobody's watching my content. Where in reality, what you're seeing is that is, that is your target client. That's really the only person you want watching this stuff, right? You'd rather have 
a video with 10 views where all 10 of those people were in your target market. Let's say five of those people call your office and you convert half of them, right? So that 10 views turns into two and a half clients versus let's say you get a thousand view video that's talking about a trending public interest story that's going to get you know, 10,000 views, but nobody's going to call your firm to hire you. So where do you want to go, right? What do you want to do? Now, the low views, right, that, that how to beat a first offense DUI in the Phoenix City Court on a Thursday, right? Very specific. You're going to have to do a lot of those to cast that big net. And then you start to see the compounding effect of all of those little bits, all those little ornaments you've hung out there in the world to capture eyeballs. And if you're doing your job in your videos and providing real value, right, actually delivering value, not 30 seconds of saying, hey, we can beat your case, call us. You say, hey, this is how to beat a first offense DUI in the city of Phoenix. And what I'm doing now is 30 minute videos on that topic so that the client goes, this guy's an authority on this. I have nobody else to call except them. And it, it works that way, to be honest. So that's, you know, that's the approach that I take. Stand out by getting very specific and answering the very specific questions, which means you got to do a high volume of this stuff, which means you got to optimize for speed of production creating content has to be a little sliver of your day until you can bootstrap it into a bigger strap of your day. Or you got you to delegate, you know, systematize this in a way so that you've got some help so that you really can turn the crank a little bit more. Uh, I think, so when I hear you talk about that and going hyper niche and, and really uh, like worrying about, or, or somebody who might be worried about not getting thousands and thousands of views, um, I create a lot of content and I get like hundreds of views and sometimes I get down on myself, but that's, to me, that's really cool. I have a hundred potential lawyers yeah. who might want to work with me, who are listening to me just jabber on about uh, like yes. stuff that I'm nerdy about, right. but I've, I flip it in the reverse. Um, I think like if I put, uh, say I put a, like a, a Google ad uh, up on a specific keyword and I had 10,000 clicks on that and I had no conversions, right? If, even if my video got 10,000 views and I had no conversions, um, like the 10,000 views wouldn't make me feel any better. The 10,000 clicks on that, on that ad would cost me a ton of money. It wouldn't make right. me feel any better. But if I only got 10 clicks on that, but I got two conversions, well, I'm going to feel great about that. Right. right. And, uh, and, and I think lawyers are focused on like the vanity metrics yeah. where what you should be focused on is the actual conversions and the stuff that's going to make you money because sure, the vanity metrics might be sexy, but the conversions are ultimately what, what's going to keep you you know, in the positive and, uh, and help you grow your practice in a sustainable way, which is what we're talking about. So I know that you talk specifically about uh, sharing like publicly this valuable legal advice to your potential customers. And I've actually run into this all the time is people will tell me that that's totally problematic. You shouldn't be uh, giving out legal advice. Um, and and to, to their credit, like, I can't answer that question. I'm not a lawyer. I don't know that um, because I can basically say whatever I want as long as it's not harming anybody. Well, for the time being anyway, with the First Amendment. Um, but so why should attorneys feel like, why should they feel okay about sharing their legal knowledge in a video to prospective clients? So I'm a little bit curious about your, about the objection that you heard, you know, is, is it, is it an ethical problem or is it that they're giving too much value away? No ethical problem. Yeah. Ethical problems. Okay. So yeah. And, and I've heard that also. And there are a lot of lawyers out there. There's a, there's a, a, an ethics council attorney here in the state of Arizona that is really, she's really, she's an amazing woman, but very difficult to talk to because everything you say is a bar violation. Everything that comes out of your mouth is a bar violation. It's violating ethics rule, whatever, 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 whatever. And you know, you, you can, you can operate, I think in that, in that world, I feel very confident that what I'm doing on YouTube is not giving legal advice. And the way that I can sort of satisfy that is by saying that this is a unidirectional conversation. I don't know anything about that person's case at all. And when I actually create my content, it's not advice about, you know, I never say the word you should do this or you should do that. It's very explanatory. You know, it's just sort of opening up the statutes and explaining how these things work. How do the different statutory uh, sentencing guidelines interface with one another? Where does this live in the law? What's the process when you go to court? And a lot of that stuff, it's sort of, you know, it's, it's just informational. It's not, it's not really recommending anything. And at the end of the videos, right, there's always an invitation to come and have a conversation with our team if you do want to hire a, law, a lawyer and then talk about what you should do with your case, right? And 
you know, we've, we've never, I've, like I said, I've got you know, about, about 550 sort of heavy legal topic videos out there now. And we've never had any problems with the bar because I think that we're perfectly within the rules. I would, of course, encourage everybody to, you know, review your bar rules and talk to legal counsel about what you're doing. But we've done that. And I feel pretty confident that what I'm doing is operating within, within the, the proper framework. And you know, you're seeing more and more lawyers do this. And I think that bars, just as a practical matter, are going to have to recognize this and just see, right? I mean, you know, there's there's a younger generation of lawyers, you know, even you know, considerably younger than me who are on TikTok and on Instagram and you know, they're reeling it up. And so this the sort of I think the bar is gonna have to adapt to this new environment. You know, even if they're unhappy with some of the things that are going on, this is the new reality of just how this stuff works. And um, I think, you know, honestly, as long as you're not giving legal advice, which really you can't do because you're not talking to other people, you're just explaining things. I really think that you're in the clear. And, you know, I, I can on my on my YouTube shows, right, I can get pretty, pretty political. I can get really pretty aggressive with some of my political opinions and things. And all that, I think, is protected right by free speech and lawyers are supposed to be advocates and I haven't seen any consequences from the bar. Not, you know, I'm not inviting any. I do try to follow the rules, but I think that, you know, law school will oftentimes scare us into this world of submission where we're so concerned about uh, an improper blue book citation and what the judge is going to do to us, where, you know, it's like we, we, we can be advocates in public. We can communicate these things. I know social media is not sort of the first place that lawyers look because we live in a different field, a different environment, but I think that there's there's a, a lot of room to expand the conversation without being fearful of any potential repercussions from the bar. Uh, I'm glad to hear that you know the person who's in charge of like the bar violations and uh, and you're still OK uh, because you're, you're you you are a little outspoken and I appreciate I am. that about you, yeah. uh, which. Again, protected. Why do we live here? Uh, I could say whatever I want as long as I'm not. Uh, like shouting fire in a, well, no, that's not necessarily true either. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, so, and you did mention like reels and TikTok and Instagram, right? Um, which is referring to like this really short form sort of like clip uh, type content that, uh, that, that lawyers are starting to get into. Um, those kind of videos are, are what I think when I'm talking about video or when you're talking about video to other lawyers, sort of come to top of, uh, of mind. How much effort do you think law firms should be putting into building a video, a video presence on, on social media? So social media, I think, is, is extremely important, but I think that they should be, and I sort of lump YouTube kind of into that category to some degree, but I think that the other platforms should be secondary to YouTube. And I say that without any equivocation at all. And the reason for that is because, well, a couple of reasons. One is just sort of content consumption, right? I think TikTok, Instagram, Facebook Reels, these are all more consumable type of content. People are just scrolling around. They're just flipping through things. And the goal of, of that type of marketing, again, this, this depends on what you're trying to accomplish. So I'm sort of speaking here, presuming that people want clients for their law firms rather than big audiences. And if you want big audiences, then yeah, you can grow very rapidly with a lot of YouTube shorts, a lot of TikToks, right? There, the, the growth potential there is, is massive. But I have still not seen a lot of evidence that that converts into business for law firms, right? Now, if you're selling something, like if you're selling a widget, you might see a TikTok reel and go, oh, that's interesting. I might go to Amazon and buy that thing. But they're typically, right, this is more disposable content. Sometimes, you know, you can have the idea that you'll, you'll create an audience, create a community, create a brand, and people will follow you. And then maybe they'll be your referral source, right? They'll catch somebody who got in trouble or they need a divorce or whatever, and then they'll refer them over to you. But what I like about YouTube is that it's, it's search-based and the consumption habits on YouTube are about education, about information. It's longer form content. And so you can really provide value, right? If there's anything that I could share today, it's about providing value in your content, whatever, whatever else you hear me say. And it's harder to do that in a short form vertical video that's only 60 seconds, right? It's difficult to explain a complex, let's go back to the first offense DUI example, right? Hard for me to really deliver meaningful value to the person in that position in 60 seconds or a few minutes, right? On these reels. So what you're able to do on YouTube is create 
something of massive value first. And then from that, you can pull and reclip or, or sort of you know, syndicate that content to some of these other platforms, which is really what, you know, what, what we do. I am experimenting with uh, YouTube shorts for the law firm with just these short little snippets. And you know, I'm trying a lot of different modalities, but the, the tried and true method, you know, and remember that Google owns YouTube. So if you're, if you're searching on Google, you're often gonna see YouTube results pulled right into the search page. And YouTube by itself is, you know, many, by many metrics, the second biggest search engine in the United States. So you're gathering, right, tons of eyeballs. You're, you're, you're swimming in the biggest ponds that exist. And the content on this platform is going to live a lot longer. Facebook, right, and Instagram, these things are fleeting. They're gone. They go to the bottom of your reel. And nobody's really searching on there to find a lawyer. Versus on YouTube, right, they're going to sit down. They're going to probably watch two or three of your videos. They're going to go check out your website because they are in education mode. And that content is going to live forever. And because it's searchable and it integrates with Google, you're going to get two for one. And anything you put on YouTube, you can always tr trim down and repurpose for the other platforms. Uh, so say that we've convinced somebody that videos are valuable. Um, and they're like, okay, I understand. Uh, everything I do is an excuse, so on and so forth. Um, What's your sort of like your checklist for the things that um, somebody would need in order to get started uh, creating videos like today? So you probably already have it, right? You probably already have a webcam. You probably already have a cell phone. I know that, you know, a lot of people say this line, but it is true. I have a cell phone that I use, right? It's this one right here. It's an S20 Galaxy S21. I think it's like the older model. And I literally record videos that I publish every morning. I just put it in selfie mode and I put it on the end of a selfie stick and I just walk around and talk about stuff. I've recorded legal videos like this on our, on our law firm channel, right? You can go watch some of these things. And it's just a phone, just a phone. If you don't have a selfie stick, you have an arm. So you can just put your arm out and that will replace your selfie stick. And, and you basically got it. Now, if you want to level things up, right? Most of my videos, and you can still go back on my channel and look at the very first videos I ever did. I've left them up. Right. Those were just a webcam. That's it. Like I had a Logitech webcam. I put that on. Uh, I had an open window and that was literally it. Right. And then I experimented and I started adding things to that. I got some lights. Like now I've got a like, I've got this sure microphone. I've got a much nicer Sony uh, a seven four camera, right? I've got multiple screens here, but these were additions that I've added over the years. Right. And had I waited until I got all this uh, in place, I would have never started creating content. So, you know, my, my, my second biggest thing is to just try, try it, start it, try something on, put a hat on, see how it feels. If you don't like it, take it off, put another one on. And, you know, people, uh, as part of the checklist there, it's, you know, a little grace, a little sympathy for yourself. It's a little pat on the back for trying something new, for stepping outside of your comfort zone, because it really is a rewarding experience. As, as I was sort of explaining before we jumped on here, you know, I have, one of the biggest rewards is, is not really the term in terms of the clients that we've generated or the revenue, really. That's all nice, but we're helping people and we're and I'm actually developing what I feel is like a skill set that's in alignment with what I wanted to do by practicing law in the first place. It's rewarding. We're connecting with people. Even if they don't hire our law firm, they can still watch videos and go solve some of their problems on their own. And it's it's really why I got into this. So, you know, I, I encourage people to do it, but with a little sensitivity you know, a, a little understanding to yourself because it is scary. It can be something that is very new and it can be, you know, rattling and you put stuff on there, you get some neat, mean comments and stuff, you know, it's, you know, it can be a little bit jarring, but, you know, give yourself a little bit of grace, encourage yourself, love yourself up a little bit. And, uh, and I, I'd say, you know, give it a shot because it really is worth it. I love the, uh, like, give yourself a little grace. Uh, just like, I don't know, uh, when you try to learn how to do something new, uh, I'll give you a good example. I, I recently started playing slow pitch softball. Okay. Uh, you would think that hitting a giant yellow ball thrown <laughs> underhand from 50 feet away would be very easy to, to hit. It is not. Yeah. Um, I am not very good at it. And, uh, and it's easy for me to get discouraged because like, I'm not great at this like seemingly easy sport. Right. Um, but uh, what I do is I practice. Um, right. I like I have a catch with my friends uh, on baseball fields uh, on the weekends and in the morning because I, I care a little bit about it. And little by slowly, I get a little bit better. 
um, I'm still not very good at slow pitch softball because it's just a hobby that I'm not trying to turn into a career. Um, but like sometimes you swing and miss, uh, sometimes you goof up on camera, sometimes you have a zit, um, and it, you know, you're a human being, uh, right. I think if, if I have a gaffe today and, uh, and you're okay with it, then I'm okay with your gaffe today. Um, right. if you're listening to this, so I want to encourage everybody because I, I'm a serious believer in this, especially for, uh, like, especially for lawyers who have made it this far into this video, right? Um, if, if our audience wants to hear more from you and get involved in, in like really growing their law firm by doing the stuff that we're talking about, how can they go about connecting with you moving forward? Yeah, I'd love to talk to anybody. I, I, I love talking shop. I love talking YouTube. I'm happy to take a look at your, your YouTube channel if you've got one and uh, give you my assessment on it, right? I can take a look, say, hey, these videos, you can get some more mileage out of it. Even if you already have stuff that's on there, right? That maybe is not performing well, we might be able to just change the title, change the thumbnail and squeeze some juice out of there. And so just a couple quick ch you know, changes might turn those videos into non-views, into views. And I'm happy to just take a look at your channel. If you want to send me an email at robert at rrlawaz.com. Or if you want to talk about any of these things, I, uh, I have a private Facebook group, so I can invite you to that where I drop some knowledge from time to time. And so uh, I love talking shop. I love connecting with other lawyers. It's a big part of, I think, what makes us better advocates is sort of learning from each other and seeing what works. And so I'm sure I'll learn something from you during our, our conversation. So happy to help. Please reach out robert at rrlawaz.com. Robert, uh, well, before I say this, I want to reiterate that everybody who has attended or is watching or cares about this at all, uh, in the recast of this, all of the links to uh, anywhere you can contact Robert and join the Facebook group and, uh, and see his YouTube channel, everything like that will be linked in the description. It'll also be sent in an email follow-up so that you don't have to worry about like furiously typing down uh, notes or writing out if you're using a pen and paper. I am not, uh, but I wanna, Robert, Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's always a pleasure talking to you. Uh, we should do it. We should make a habit of doing it more. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us today for Legal Marketing Day.